So, in the last PMC instalment, I basically went over uh, a couple of the most basic arguments that people use for uh, PMCs. So, I think it's important, again, for framing the argument, that we go over basically just the most common arguments used ethically, um, or at least by necessity, for PMCs being good, for PMCs being bad, and this will give you a basic overview, and I aim to do it incredibly quickly, that's why I'm talking very quickly. Um, so, here we go, we're going to frame the argument, and hopefully, I guess, we can then actually start going into the more complex stuff. So first off, for pro, basically proponents of PMCs, they say that it's historically common. A lot of historians agree with this one, sort of during times of war, civilians are often uh, required to fill certain roles in the war effort. Yet beyond this, in the modern day and in ages gone by, People are paid for military services, you know, that are civilians, and the question arises, what degree do we consider people liable for the product of their service? Uh, it is to an extent DDE, as someone pointed out in, uh, in the comment section of another video. It follows that we consider people liable for the product of their services, but similar logic to a lot of ethics that's built upon the idea uh, of some form of sort of the ends justify the means, that line of argument. One can look at that as necessity, or traditionally Machiavellian, or you can perceive it in a lot of ways, but the common argument is that evil does exist and in the world, and sometimes we have to do things that we aren't comfortable with to combat it, and we actually do that within our society, uh, and people potentially should be able to do that uh, in order to do good, effectively. And those things, in a lot of cases, aren't good, even if they do have uh, bad consequences, despite the good intention. And this is historically common, as I'm saying. Uh, firms I talk about more commonly on this channel, perhaps. Uh, large defence firms which produce products, defence systems, that may inflict harm, uh, which I think are they're absolutely justified in doing so, brilliant firms anyway. It's necessary, um, but beyond necessity, necessary, it's good to protect one's nation, and, you know, it's about the level of detachment. Historically speaking, if you are, let's say, making a bomb that then goes off and kills so many people, are you as, and I don't necessarily know the answer because it's an incredibly tough, tough uh, ethical question, is one as liable as someone who goes out protecting a compound, let's say, with a PMC and you shoot one person, or maybe injure one person, that sort of thing. Uh, and again, historically speaking, contracting is common. Uh, at the end of the day, people can argue in circles about this sort of stuff. Contracting is common nowadays, uh, and many sort of question the difference, perhaps, between making a Gatling gun that fires 40 millimeter rounds uh, at a rate of a ridiculous rate per minute, and then selling that piece of equipment and being boots on the ground, potentially. So realistically, there's only one degree of separation, and historically speaking, if one's talking about a total coordinated war effort, then that might not be so different, particularly if one's assisting uh, national forces in their uh, effort of war, as we saw on the war on terror, where PMCs got involved with Western national governments. So that's both in this particular scenario. Let's say they're employed by a military or a government. That does give them legitimacy, and people would argue that it's warranted and historically common, so we're all good. Secondarily, the common war effort. So if one's con to consider that at times of crisis, certain people take on certain roles that they wouldn't perhaps ordinarily, uh, and there are organisations that ensure that, then perhaps it's a good idea that we have PMCs, that not only we have people who are trained up that keep in with Nick, but we have people who are out fighting uh, where they should be, and that we have reserve roles. I think someone was saying if you registered all PMCs to the Territorial Army, that would be a huge, huge bonus to the UK, uh, and would give us a brilliant list of reserves were we ever to get into large-scale conflict again, so that's a very good thing. Also, if one considers World War II, let's say, there were people paid to carry out certain duties that helped the war effort. Let's say I'm someone laying sandbags, operating a searchlight for enemy uh, planes, and I'm paid for it, and I probably have some sort of uh, if I'm operating in foreign territories or at home, I probably have some sort of weapon system during wartime. I don't know if they were paid or not uh, in World War II, but such duties during wartime are acceptable to be paid for. And actually, it can be moral to pay people for that, even pay through certain organisations. 
Certain organizations were paid to create bunkers, lay sandbags, all sorts really, that fall under defense. And there were people paid to guard uh, bunkers, let's say, in you know a lot of places during World War II, who weren't necessarily military people, but effectively did it because they were there and the military had a more important job to do. So it can be important, particularly during wartime. So such action, whether it's virtuous, uh, whether it's you know done out of basically pro bono, or whether it's paid for or not, if the country needs it, and it is you know by necessity needed if they're paying it for you, then it's probably virtuous. Also, if we have all sorts of organisations that aren't the actual army, PMCs, that are kept just in case within the territorial army, uh, reserves, they are paid. Uh, and let's say this isn't within a PMC, both the reserves, uh, you know, the reserves are paid, put it that way. Uh, they train and they're paid to carry out duties within the community and they uh, have continued existence even beyond wartime capability, beyond their necessity. So it is important that one is prepared for those certain situations, which is why PMCs could be in, of huge value if you put them into the territorial army. More than that, they are of huge value anyway because you maintain uh, an out and powerful fighting force that is there if you need it. Uh, and you don't necessarily have to contract it, do you? That's the entire point. So let's say that we have no PMCs ready, and war comes and the nation doesn't have a large enough fighting force, uh, or let's say enough men to create a strong fighting force. They're stuck doing tasks which don't actually further the war, war effort. Then the nation is stuffed. You often need, or with declining national standing militaries, you often need people who are there to fill in these roles that may require some sort of conflict, but uh, allow the actual army to get on with their job and actually basically minimize loss uh, through completing military campaigns quicker. Uh, you know, it's that sort of argument. If you don't end World War II, uh, then through certain conflict, then a lot more people die, and that's a very bad thing. Then we also have the effectiveness argument. If you're going to have these people defending uh, a certain area, that they're going to be carrying out the tasks that perhaps the military in an ideal world, in a utopian world, would, uh, then they are going to need to do that to the best of their ability. One can't necessarily cripple them in the way they do it. One would have to allow them the same military capabilities, if not the same military license, if they're operating simultaneously with a military, to defend it as best they can. So. Good soldiers don't just defend the area they're tasked with. Good soldiers go out and, you know, sort of preemptively defend. They go out there and get the guys who are trying to harm them. They go out there and, you know, set up certain defences. They are not just there necessarily as cannon fodder. And that's an important thing because that means that if they are fighting alongside a national army, they remain an integral unit. And, of course, a lot of this is fighting alongside uh, a national standing army. And we'll look at arguments for non-national standing armies and fighting alone, let's say. Uh, in certain conflicts, that's sort of the fireman argument at a later date. But there is, I'd say, uh, real merit to a lot of these arguments, both, uh, well, in uh, sort of common war effort, the idea that it is historically common, the idea that there aren't that many degrees of separation in the war effort, uh, that payment isn't necessarily a bad thing, and that, you know, one doesn't want to cripple forces that are contracted by necessity, in order to make the campaign force the most effective it can be, and to not, uh, and to basically minimise your own national casualties and the casualties of the area you're trying to protect, so that the army can basically complete the campaign quicker. And that's all a pretty good argument. And of course, no one's going to be able to understand it because I said it incredibly quickly, because I'm in a bit of a rush, um, and I basically just ramble that so it might not be that clear but you know watched a few times and you might understand it that coupled with the effect effectiveness argument actually gives us a really good argument for uh sort of in total for the idea that pmcs should be allowed to exist and should be able to train and then when times of war arise they should be able to operate alongside national militaries and even in times of peace they should be allowed to operate alongside national militaries if one is to agree with the contractor argument in regard to the most common arguments against, and these are all, every single argument I'm going to mention today is a pretty decent argument, far better than firemen and free market. Uh, 
in regard to against PMCs, of course, there is the idea that one doesn't want to incentivize profit through war. Generally, that is seen as a bad thing. And again, we have this very visceral reaction. The idea that once profits increase due to harm occurring basically makes us think that uh, incentivization is not only to support but to propagate conflict. So it's particularly, I guess, given that one could label their jobs as preventing war, uh, that is their function, they're you know, basically there to aid certain conflicts, uh, fulfill certain roles so that war can be ended quicker, so that we can get back to a time of peace. The fact of the matter is, if you are then to say profit incentive, I guess, goes against that, then that's not a very good thing. At least the army uh, is sort of set in its aims. I don't agree with that one, but nonetheless. Then we've got, you know, sort of classical pacifism. I'm not going to go over that. I don't think it's a brilliant argument. Uh, but that's probably one of the more common ones against PMCs. Then we've got the idea that um, there is desire for basically profit, of course. There's the profit incentive of war that basically means they profit from conflict, and that might mean that profit, uh, that conflict is incentivized for them. But beyond this, the idea that they do profit uh, means that they have to look after it as if it's a business. And the fact of that matter is that, you know, military, as much as we often compare them, military and business decision-making don't go hand in hand. Uh, I was listening to a talk uh, by Simon Mann, and he basically put out this point very well. You know, simply, if there's a need for four helicopters uh, and you are an army, you're going to get four helicopters because you realise what's within military necessity. Whereas, you know, I mean, obviously they are trying to cover costs and that sort of thing and balance the budget, but nonetheless they are going to get four helicopters because they generally uh, prefer operational capability or at least maximisation of operational capability to a greater degree to businesses. PMC, if it needs four helicopters and it needs to buy one more, let's say, or buy two more, it's not going to do that because that's expensive. It has to worry about costs. It has to worry about profit. And in both of these, that can uh, either incentivize conflict or it can mean that military decision making is really poor because you're running it from the perspective of maximization of profit, not basically making the campaign uh, I guess more smooth uh, and sort of minimizing loss of life in that sense. So both profit and costs, you know, the uh, or revenue and costs, as it were, to sum together to make the maximization of profit. The idea of the top line and the bottom line mean that you have a real issue in uh, making military decisions. And this actually reinforces itself, the fact that if you're making poor military decisions to maximise profit, uh, conflict then continues, which means you get paid even more, uh, and that's not necessarily a very good thing. People who are against this don't think. Again, I don't think these arguments are incredible, but nonetheless, they are the most common. And finally, for today, and I have done this mega quickly, uh, the idea that PMCs take people out of the army. We saw a huge exodus in the 90s of people from the army. Whether that's caused by PMCs or not, we don't really know. But the fact of the matter is that these people are trained up by the state's money. And uh, people, the state, uh, citizens of the state, a lot of people really dislike the idea uh, that from a sound sort of policy perspective, we train these people up as a country and then they move on and use those skills elsewhere. We effectively lose all of that capability. Uh, the amount we trained up, it's sort of the same thing if I go in for an apprenticeship and they train me up for a couple of years and then I decide to go and work for another firm, the firm that trained me up feels a bit cheated. So uh, the fact that it can actually interfere with the army itself, it might not necessarily work alongside it and then that means that not only are people leaving the army but the people they trained up to be in the army, they then have to pay for their services from another private military firm. Uh, so that's just, you know, huge cost for the government and that, you know, makes people fairly unhappy. So I have done that incredibly quickly and I'm going to finish before the 15 minute mark because I don't want it to drone on too long. What we have had today, uh, that it's historically common, common war effort, uh, the idea of detachment, uh, the effectiveness of argument, profit incentive, war, pacifism, desire for profit, and that it takes people out of the army. And I'm going to finish before 15 minutes, the end.